We are in the endgame right now. The arguments have been made. The prosecution has presented its case. The defense has constructed its defense. And now we are awaiting the jury to decide whether or not Officer Derek Chauvin will be convicted of second degree murder third degree murder or manslaughter charges. Now throughout this developing in the news media, I have been covering this case for you, giving you my thoughts on where the prosecution was gonna go, what the defense was going to lay out as their reason or justification for Officer Derek Chauvin's actions, and how I thought the jury would ultimately end up voting. However, once the trial started, once evidence started being presented, I wanted to wait until it concluded before I gave my analysis. Because monitoring a trial day to day and talking about where things turned or where they flipped back the other way and stuff like that is just something that I'm not very interested in and I don't think it's very helpful analysis. Because if we're getting certain information on day one, I could tell you that the prosecution won that day and then the rebuttal comes the following day or a couple of days later, then I'm just going to make the same video talking about how the defense killed it and it's way better to analyze a trial once it's been concluded in its totality. So the major question that you guys probably have on your mind right now is which way is the jury going to go? And hopefully this video is cleared by YouTube before the jury actually reaches its verdict. Otherwise, it's going to look really dumb when I upload this video. And the answer to that question, unfortunately, is I don't know. I will tell you how I would vote if I were a juror based on the information that I have. But when it comes to these 14 people that basically hold the fate of every major city in the country in their hands, because there will be rioting if this verdict doesn't come down the way that the left wants, and even if Chauvin does get convicted of the harshest charges, there might be rioting just in case they want to celebrate by destroying property. But regardless, there are four options that the jury can go with. The first is a standard guilty verdict on the harshest charge that the jury agrees on unanimously. We all know how that will break down, and that will lead to the least amount of civil unrest in this country. I still think there might be some, you know, in celebration of it, but it will be the least amount, hopefully. The second option, of course, and obviously, is a not guilty on all counts. This will be the most disastrous for every major metropolitan area because the way the media has been covering this trial, you would think that it was a slam dunk case for the prosecution. It's incredibly irresponsible, and it's not just the mainstream media, but it's social media influencers that keep talking about how if Chauvin is found not guilty, even though we all saw what happened as if that video is the extent of the entire case, has led up to people getting a misunderstanding of what's been presented in this trial and will lead to the maximum amount of unrest. The third option, which may be just as bad as a not guilty verdict in terms of what's going to happen in our major cities and potentially even worse, is the hung jury option. Now, the reason that this has the potential to be even worse is that if the jury can't reach a verdict, we're going to have to go through this whole trial all over again. So we'll get the rioting and the unrest from the jury not being able to convict and we will all be primed up for another round of this nonsense. And the fourth option is technically an unofficial option. It's something that juries aren't supposed to do. But in reality, this is a compromise that is made in jury rooms almost all the time. And this is the compromise conviction, what I like to call the negotiated guilty verdict. This is when they do a poll and a lot of jurors aren't going to move away from their not guilty and a lot of jurors won't move away from their guilty verdicts. And rather than actually have a hung jury, what the jurors end up doing is they compromise on a lower charge. So that way, the people who feel like he should be convicted on the highest charge get their way a little bit. And the people who don't feel like there should be a conviction, but maybe he did something wrong can give in a little bit. This is a compromise verdict. It happens all the time. We'll never really know until some of these jurors come forward that this is the case if he's convicted of manslaughter, but this is a potential option. We're looking for a guilty verdict and we're looking to see if all of the talk that took place and has been taking place after they saw what happened to George Floyd, if nothing does not happen, then we know uh, that we've got to not only stay in the street, but we've got to fight for justice. But I am very hopeful and I hope uh, that we're going to get a verdict that to say guilty, guilty, guilty. And if we don't, we, got, we cannot go away. And unfortunately, this will not alleviate rioting either because people like Congresswoman Maxine Waters have called for unrest if Officer Derek Chauvin isn't convicted of first degree murder. And not just manslaughter, right? I mean- Oh no, 
not manslaughter. No, no, no. This is, this is guilty for murder. I don't know whether it's in the first degree, but as far as I'm concerned, it's first degree. It's not now, of course, Maxine Waters not banned from any social media. They don't call her an insurrectionist. People don't even make fun of her for being completely ignorant about the case that she's talking about because Officer Derek Chauvin isn't even charged with first degree murder. But that is out there in the ether. And in fact, the judge actually commented on this, that if this is proven to bias some of the jurors, this could be grounds for a mistrial. So even if he's convicted, it is not over. Upon appeal, all this outside influence on the case can definitely overturn this, and we'll just have the rioting later on. I'm aware that Congresswoman Waters was talking specifically about this trial and about the unacceptability of uh, anything less than a murder conviction and talk about being confrontational, but you can submit the press articles about that. This goes back to what I've been saying from the beginning. I wish elected officials would stop talking about this case especially in a manner that is disrespectful to the rule of law and to the judicial branch in our function. I think if they want to give their opinions, they should do so in a respectful and in a manner that is consistent with their oath to the Constitution to respect a co-equal branch of government. Now, those are the options in my mind. I will be polling your guys' opinion on the community tab to let me know what you guys think. But now I'm going to make the case for why I think the 14 jurors should actually vote not guilty in this case. Because there are key pieces of evidence, some that I didn't even know up until trial, that were introduced that create the reasonable doubt that the prosecution needs to overcome in order to ensure a conviction. Remember, the defense does not have to argue what happened. They just have to poke holes in the prosecution's case. The state has the burden of proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt. I've been seeing a lot of weird legal analysis where people who supposedly work for the Department of Justice were talking about how the prosecution has this in the bag because the defense isn't trying to prove Officer Derek Chauvin innocent. What they're trying to do is poke holes within the state's case in order to prove that their client is not guilty. Translation, the defense is doing what they are supposed to do as a defense, and these supposed legal experts are confused by it. Now first, we have to dismiss some misinformation and disinformation out there that's being spread by irresponsible media outlets and not very smart social media influencers about what the prosecution is actually presenting in terms of this case. And I will go to the key piece of evidence, which is the autopsy conducted by the Hennepin County Coroner, which states that the cause of death for George Floyd was due to complications during arrest and police restraint, as well as neck compression. Now, a lot of dumb and embarrassing people out there will bring up the Michael Baden report and they'll talk about how there's actually two autopsies that confirm cause of death is a homicide. But it's very important to note that Michael Baden is a fraud. He's a gun for hire for civil suits, as I told you when this initial report came out. He's the person that lied during the O.J. Simpson investigation, and that is not speculation that he lied at trial. He came out a year later during the civil suit and said that his claims were ridiculous and recanted them. Unfortunately, that led to the not guilty verdict in the O.J. Simpson trial, but I'm guessing that $167,000 was worth it to say ridiculous things like Nicole Brown Simpson was standing perfectly still when her throat was slit, and Ron Goldman fought off the real killer that's definitely not O.J. Simpson for over 10 minutes after his jugular vein was slit. The reason that Baden made those claims at trial was to give O.J. Simpson an alibi. He needed Goldman to be the target in his scenario, and he needed Goldman to have been able to fight despite the fact that he would have been bleeding out profusely after his jugular was slit for over 10 minutes for that to work. So he did it at trial because he was paid. But the crucial point is, is that Baden, the disgraced celebrity coroner's autopsy, is not being included by the prosecution because it actually contradicts what the prosecution is saying is cause of death, the Hennepin County coroner's diagnosis, and Michael Baden has admitted that he did not base cause of death on autopsy, he based it on the videotape. The compressive pressure uh, of the neck and back are not seen at autopsy because the pressure has been re released by the time the body comes to the medical examiner's office. It can only be seen uh, serious compressive pressure on the neck and, and uh, back can only be seen while the pressure is being applied or when, as in this instance, it is captured on video. 
So anybody saying that there are two autopsies that came to the same conclusion is either lying to you or they are so ill-informed about the facts related to this case, they are absolutely embarrassing. The crucial autopsy is the state's autopsy because that is what is presented at evidence. And as we talked about, when you go to the neck injuries portion of the autopsy, it says no fatal injuries to the neck. And if you go to the toxicology report, you will find about three times what is normally diagnosed as a fentanyl overdose in George Floyd's bloodstream. These are the crucial pieces of evidence that bring cause of death within question, and this has been true since this autopsy report was released. But it actually gets worse than that, because one of the things that I did not know up until very recently is that upon re-examination of the squad car that Floyd was actually dragged through before he was put on the ground, they actually found pills that were a combination of fentanyl and meth. And these pills were chewed up and they had George Floyd's saliva on them. 20, there appeared to be white substances throughout the back seat of the squad car. Uh, so myself and some of the other defendants, attorneys, and our investigators went to inspect Squad 320. Uh, it was very apparent that what was in Squad 320 was controlled substances. The state of Minnesota um, then subsequently uh, had those substances taken out of the squad car and tested. Uh, they are, in fact, methamphetamine and fentanyl, and they contain the DNA of George Floyd. Um, so they are chewed, partially chewed up uh, pills. In addition, Your Honor, the additional evidence that was discovered, uh, the state executed a second, uh, second search warrant on the Mercedes-Benz that was being driven by Mr. Floyd and located in the center council of those of the Mercedes-Benz were two pills that were identical to the two pills that or appeared to be identical to the pills that were in squad 320. Those pills were analyzed and those pills also contained methamphetamine and fentanyl. So not only do we have a fatal level of fentanyl within George Floyd's system at autopsy, but on top of that, we have evidence to believe that George Floyd was swallowing pills right before he died. That that whole fuss when he was initially pulled over where they couldn't see his hands and he was leaning away might have actually been George Floyd swallowing these pills. And we have evidence of that because some of them were spit up in the back of the police car. The fact that this wasn't reported as a major headline across every newspaper when this was discovered is absolutely shameful, but it goes to show you where our media is headed and what they're actually interested in presenting to you. Now, on top of that, now that we know that Floyd with reasonable certainty was swallowing pills to hide evidence from the police, before he died, we also found out that the person in the passenger side of the vehicle when Floyd was pulled over was actually his drug dealer, a drug dealer that took the fifth because he didn't want to testify and incriminate himself in George Floyd's death. Mr. Hall has been subpoenaed as a witness in this case by both the prosecution and defense. Defense counsel in their opening statement specifically named Mr. Hall and told the jury that they intend to call him and previewed what that testimony they believe would be. So in order to avoid any kind of delay or interruption in these proceedings, I notified all parties that Mr. Hall would be invoking his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination where he called to testify. I then subsequently filed my notice, uh, my motion to quash the subpoena. Your Honor, at this point in time, Mr. Hall has no immunity. He has been provided no immunity, no protection for his testimony whatsoever. And because of that, Mr. Hall is invoking his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination in several key areas of questioning that we believe he would face were he to be called to testify. Well, let's stop you there. You said on certain areas that he would testify to. So there are some topics that he would not incriminate him. Is that correct? Your Honor, the, I cannot envision any topics that Mr. Hall would be called to testify on that would be both relevant to the case that would not incriminate him. Well, that's ultimately the court's decision, correct? Yes. Okay. And that's on a question-by-question question basis, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Go ahead. I interrupted you. No, that's okay, Judge. And just uh, for brevity, I wanted to outline those areas that I believe Mr. Hall may face questioning. Um, the first area where he would be invoking his privilege against self-incrimination is any activities um, that took place on May 25th, 2020, both before and after police arrived. Okay. Mr. Hall's testimony in these matters would 
specifically um, put him in the position of being in very close proximity to Mr. Floyd. There's an allegation here that Mr. Floyd ingested a controlled substance as police were removing him from the car. A car, by the way, that has been searched twice and to my understanding, drugs have been found in that car twice. This leaves Mr. Hall potentially incriminating himself into a future prosecution for third degree murder. And specifically, that's 609.195 subdivision B. And that statute, as the court is well aware, covers third degree murder liability for someone who is involved in drug activity that eventually leads in an overdose. And that statute is broad, Judge. Uh, it does not just include the situation where A sells drugs to B, B then succumbs to an overdose. In fact, it includes um, any activity directly or indirectly, unlawfully selling, giving away, bartering, delivering, exchanging, distributing, or administering a controlled substance classified as Schedule 1 or 2. Now, taking the Fifth Amendment on its own is not evidence of wrongdoing. But the fact that the prosecution didn't offer this person immunity from prosecution in order to get him to testify is prosecutorial malfeasance. This is a key witness that was not presented before a jury at trial, even though his testimony can either condemn or clear Chauvin during this trial. The fact that the prosecution is basically withholding this witness under the threat of prosecution if this guy chooses to testify is absolutely horrible and it's a stain on this case that even if Officer Derek Chauvin is convicted, will be fought later in appeal. Also, his statements to federal investigators were not the privy of the court during this trial, even though information in those statements could turn out to exonerate or be exonerating for Officer Derek Chauvin. On top of that, as we already discussed multiple times on this channel, because I actually watched the body cam footage, and I read the transcript before the body cam footage became available to the public because Keith Ellison decided to hold off on it and let people rip each other apart so that narrative of that cell phone video would just set in. We know for a fact that George Floyd was claiming breathing distress well prior to the knee being put on his neck. He claimed that he could not breathe 13 times before he went to the ground, which is way before the knee was placed on the neck. And when your case rests on the idea that Officer Derek Chauvin choked the life out of this man with his knee, you're going to have to explain before a jury beyond a reasonable doubt why Floyd's symptoms from the knee started well before the knee. And it is based on these facts that I believe that a reasonable, unbiased jury should not be able to conclude beyond a reasonable doubt that George Floyd died due to Officer Derek Chauvin's knee being placed on his neck. And remember, that's reasonable doubt as to cause of death. We haven't even gotten into whether or not Chauvin was acting outside of his duties as a police officer, and his actions, even separate from cause of death, should qualify for conviction under the charges as charged. Now, I want to pause right here for those people who don't understand how trials work and may be misconstruing the words that I'm saying in this video. I do not have to make the case, and the defense does not have to make the case that it is beyond a reasonable doubt that George Floyd died due to a fentanyl overdose. The prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that is not the case. I'm saying that there is reasonable doubt as to cause of death, not making an affirmative statement based on cause of death. So hold the stupid comments. I know that's a little too late because they're already within the comments of this video in the live chat if you're watching this on the premiere. And if you're on the right or you're somebody who's making the argument that Chauvin should be found not guilty, keep that in mind. You do not have to prove cause of death. The state has to sufficiently prove that beyond a reasonable doubt. And then they have to prove the charges related to that. Because if Chauvin was responsible for Floyd's death, but he was acting within the procedures of the Minneapolis Police Department, it still does not rise to the level to convict him of the charges that he's currently facing. Next up, we have the restraining technique. And the prosecution has to make the case that not only was this cause of death, but it was objectively unreasonable for Officer Derek Chauvin and later on the other officers to perform this technique on George Floyd. Now we've talked about, and I will link the body cam footage in the description, George Floyd violently resisting arrest because he was violently resisting arrest. We talked about Floyd saying that he wanted to go to the ground. We've already covered that ground. Those videos will be linked in the description. I'm not gonna retread it. We're just gonna talk about the restraining technique. Now this is a Minneapolis police training manual. This is from a version that predates this case. 
because I believe it has been altered as the procedures have been changed after the death of George Floyd. Now, as you can see, this restraining technique is remarkably similar to what we saw in that iconic video. The only difference between this technique and what we see in the video is what side of the neck the person on the neck is actually on. And this can easily be explained by the fact that there was a car on that side of George Floyd. So this looks like it's a clean technique. And you can look at the side, they talk about what to do after the subject has been arrested. Now, a lot of people have been circulating just this image publicly and making it seem like this is the recovery position, but we don't do that nonsense here on this channel. So I'm gonna make this 100% clear. This is not the recovery position. The recovery position is actually this position and it's depicted only a few pages later in this training manual. And as you can see, the position of the body in this image is actually closer to what we saw George Floyd was in at the time that he was being held. However, to be clear, there is no evidence that I can find that holding the person in the way that they were restraining him in the previous position in the position that is known as the recovery position is something that is within police procedures. And this is where we get into the gray area and I'm going to explain it to you guys perfectly clearly. So you put somebody in this position when they are resisting arrest and they're on the ground in order to subdue them. However, they might be explaining that they have trouble breathing or they might be going through what is called excited delirium syndrome, et cetera, et cetera. So you're supposed to transition them to the recovery position to better aid their breathing. This is very similar to what George Floyd was actually in, except with the holding technique, of this. Now the officers will say the reason that they were holding him even when he was in the recovery position was because he was still resisting arrest. You can watch the body cam footage and know that this is in fact the case. He was resisting arrest at least until he passed out and ultimately died. Now the prosecution's case for this force being objectively unreasonable actually rests on the following. This position is okay when somebody's resisting arrest. George Floyd was resisting arrest, therefore it was okay for the officers to hold him in this position. This position is also okay because it's the recovery position and how you're supposed to have somebody when you have an ambulance on the way. They're not disputing that the officers called the ambulance. We can hear that in the body cam. They are not fully disputing that concern for George Floyd's health was not present. Remember, they did call the ambulance and there was actually a conversation between Chauvin and these officers that were holding him on the legs on what position they're supposed to put him in until the ambulance actually arrives. What they are essentially arguing is that at some point between these two acceptable positions, there is a defined point where the restraints in this position are unacceptable based on the responsiveness of George Floyd. Now, where exactly the dividing line between the restraints in this position and the recovery portion of the recovery position are divided is actually a big problem for the prosecution because they'll argue that the divide comes when he actually stopped resisting arrest. However, he was violently resisting arrest and you had a reason to believe had you gotten off of him and let him resist, he would have continued resisting arrest while handcuffed and he would have been more of a danger to himself at that moment. The other point where you can make the case that there's a dividing line when you don't need to restrain him is an obvious one if you don't think about it too much. And this is when Floyd had no pulse, which makes a lot of sense because if he had no pulse, he's literally dying. In fact, he's actually dead, so there's no reason to restrain him. However, if you're restraining somebody to the point where they have no pulse, then you're saying that the point to stop is when the person dies. And obviously that line needs to be drawn before he died if you want to actually help him. Now I understand that you perform CPR on somebody who's gone into cardiac arrest even when they don't have a pulse in the hopes that you bring them back. I'm actually acutely aware of this because I've been CPR certified since I was an undergraduate in college. However, if you're going to charge second degree murder, you can't revolve your case around failure to resuscitate. There is a difference between firing offenses and offenses that lead to criminal prosecutions that need to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Also, Minneapolis police do wait for ambulances to come and resuscitate people. That is within their procedures. Furthermore, saying that it was okay 100% until he lost his pulse, but then after he lost his pulse, when he was objectively dead, then it became murder because he lingered for a few minutes longer, 
isn't really a strong case to make. And these are the big problems I would have as a juror going along with the prosecution's case. Because when I examine the rules and regulations and procedures of the Minneapolis police, when I examine the autopsy, I can't come to both conclusions which are required in order to support a conviction. And just to be clear, I am of the opinion that the Minneapolis police training procedures are in fact incorrect. I agree with the NYPD who in 1993 banned neck restraint because on certain people who have pre-existing conditions, this can be incredibly dangerous. But we're not talking about the NYPD and we're not talking about what I personally believe to be the proper procedure is. We're talking about whether or not an officer can be convicted of murder based on the techniques that he was taught by his department were non-lethal for subjects in these situations. Now with all of that being said, I will say that the defense in this case from what I've seen has not been stellar and the prosecution is way more charismatic in presenting their case. And I know you think that that shouldn't matter, but remember jurors are human and sometimes confidence and looking like you're telling the truth is way more important in what's actually technically accurate. One of the most impressive people on the stand for me was the guy that did the autopsy for Hennepin County. I watched his entire testimony and cross-examination, and what you worry about with these technical experts is that they come off as too nerdy and unrelatable. This guy came off like a TV doctor making his case for what he believed to be cause of death. And even though I don't think it's sufficient from reading his report and really listening to his answers, the way that he presented himself is a big problem for Officer Derek Chauvin and his defense attorney. Another big problem is that even though all you technically have to do is prove reasonable doubt, poke holes in the case, what you really need to do to sway a jury sometimes is present a counter narrative. People like a good story, and I was joking about this, that is basically the lesson from Game of Thrones Season 8, but honestly, it's true. People want to have an idea in their head when they're voting not guilty on what really happened. If you're listening to a conversation and one party in that conversation is saying, this is what happened, this is 100% what happened, and then you listen to the other person in the conversation and they're saying, well, maybe this happened or maybe that happened or maybe this happened or maybe this thing happened. What I know for sure is what you're saying happened probably likely mostly didn't happen the way that you're describing. You are more likely to believe the confident declaration in the affirmative of what happened. So I do think that the chances of a conviction are actually higher than I believed pre-trial based on the fact that this was presented in a way that was favorable to the prosecution. They really stood and delivered in a lot of points during this case, and there's a lot of information that is not included in this trial that could be exonerating that can't be presented as evidence because it's not included in this trial. So this is what we're left with. 14 people meant to weigh the pros and cons not only of what's presented as evidence during the trial, but also the risks and rewards of finding a verdict based on what they objectively heard in the courtroom. The idea that this trial has been over-politicized is an understatement. Everywhere is covering this, and despite the fact that the judge says that he told these people not to watch the news media, it's hard to escape it, and it's hard to escape members of the family that know these people are on the jury that are watching the coverage constantly. But those are just my thoughts. Let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below. Also, I have my fingers and toes crossed that the verdict doesn't drop before I'm supposed to be in Kenosha, Wisconsin, at the end of the week. I don't want to be anywhere where there was rioting previously when this verdict drops. But again, comments down below. If you like the video, then show me by leaving a like. You can subscribe for more content. You can follow me on all my social media accounts linked in the description. Support me via the support links that are there. This video was up for early access for my patrons, subscribe star subscribers, etc. So that's the way to see some early ad free stuff. This has been me talking about the trial wrapping up and where I think the verdict is going. Till next time.